Okay. How's everybody doing? Now we get to enjoy me trying to share my screen. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So welcome everybody. And I'm here to talk about, you know, the challenges a lot of companies face when they're adopting SRE. Uh, my name is Jamie Allen, and uh, to prove that I'm not a totally American Cretan, I have put my date in the appropriate uh, format for uh, Oz and for Europe and pretty much the rest of the world who, you know, puts a day before the month. I also speak centigrade. Um, who am I? Uh, right now, I'm the chief technologist for AWS at EPAM Systems. We have an office in Sydney, um, but, you know, we're not a major Australian presence. Uh, we are a company with offices in, I think, 26 different countries. We have 40,000 people. We're publicly traded in the U.S. We, in 2019, did about $2.3 in services revenue. Uh, so, you know, we're a pretty big company. We do a lot of work with AWS, a lot of companies. We, we help them, you know, build out their AWS infrastructure. But a lot of them are asking us how they can, you know, maintain reliability and, and, and make sure their systems are well observed, that they're well understood and uh, they can achieve as much uptime as possible. Um, previous to this, I was working in production engineering at Facebook, like Mike Jones, who's also on the call. Uh, we were both in the core systems group, which is a share, shared infra platform, uh, running huge numbers of hosts. Uh, Mike was doing stuff that's very similar to the, you know, the, the, the Lambda platform from AWS, not to mention helping to run the Zookeeper group. I was helping to run the uh, shared a sharded data group inside the core systems group from an SRE perspective. Um, but what's also interesting about Facebook is Facebook hasn't done exactly what Google does. And that gives you a very interesting perspective about whether or not, you know, certain approaches work in different places about things you can do and things that you don't necessarily have to do, where there's value, where there might not be, because Facebook will be intentional about that. They'll say, hey, this is something we really want to focus on because we think there's great value in this. But we're not SRE per se, because we aren't following the exact Google model. I also have a blog out there. Uh, if you just uh, Google um, SRE and leadership, you'll find the link from my blog, pretty much the number one thing there, because um, I work hard to make sure that happens. So, um, But I also lived in Australia for years whenever I was uh, younger. When I was in uni, my parents lived in Brisbane, and um, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time down in Sydney. Never been to Melbourne, um, but I have friends who work at uh, consulting firms like Agile Digital, Simple Machines in Sydney, Agile Digital's in Canberra and Sydney. Uh, so I have a great relationship with the people down there and just a country I love a great deal. So always happy to visit when there's not a pandemic. Um, and if you're wondering about EPAM, um, one of the reasons that, you know, I, before I was at Facebook, I was at Starbucks, before I was at Starbucks, I was one of the the leaders of the, I was the head of global consulting and training for the company behind the Scala programming language. And one thing about that, that really I was unhappy about was I wasn't owning anything in production. And when you're a consultant, you typically don't, right? You, you aren't the person who, to use the old term, where's the beeper. You're not on call because you're the consultant. You're being billed by the hour. Nobody wants to pay an hourly rate for people to, to answer a call in the middle of the night, right? So typically it's employees who are running stuff in production. And I really missed that. And so that was one of the reasons I took a job outside of consulting, went back to, to the enterprise at Starbucks and, and put something in production again. And that really got my juices flowing. And that's one of the reasons why I transformed my career towards site reliability engineering, because it just made sense to me. It was something I found great joy from. And then I went to Facebook and I got this incredible education about it. And going to EPAM, one of the reasons it was very attractive to me is that and people don't know this, but if you Google EPAM and Epic Games, the people behind Fortnite, we work very closely together to operationalize the platform at tremendous scale. Uh, you know, whenever they have an event and they're they're hosting a DJ like Marshmallow or something like that, um, you know, a large number of people can come to the site, a large number of concurrent players. They can have, you know, uh, uh, tremendous events where they're going to have a big fight out or something like that. And we uh, we help facilitate that. And we, we do a lot of operational work as a result. So I think EPAM is unique in that regard from a consulting perspective. Um, and I really enjoy the fact that I still get to, I get to work with a lot of different customers, but I also still get to be involved in operational stuff. So before we move on, I want to real quickly ask a couple of polls and just get a sense for how you all feel about a couple of things. And I'll do this real quickly if that's all right. Um, I'm gonna start this poll about um, 
you know, has your organization adopted SRE? Are, are you a group that has yourselves done it? Uh, no, topics interest me personally. Uh, no, but we're considering it. Yes, but we struggled with some aspects and yes. So this is a very interesting mix because it's it's quite varied. Some, some people have adopted it and seem pretty comfortable. Other people have struggled. Uh, some people are considering it. Um, and then there's always the people who are just interested in the topic because we like to geek out on stuff like this. Great. And I'm going to ask one more quick question just to make sure that my audience is um, well represented in my talk, that I don't assume that everybody knows these topics as I go. How much experience do you have with SRE yourself? Uh, I'm an SRE. I totally know the Google concepts. Um, I'm an SRE. I'm aware of the Google SRE concepts, but may not be following them. I'm new to SRE and would like to learn more. Okay. Um, I'm going to really quickly, because 50 plus percent of the people, 50 percent of the people here um, are new to SRE, I'm just real quickly going to go through what is an addendum to this, this, uh, this deck and just make sure that everybody understands the topics that I'm talking about here. So let me switch down to the appendix and we're going to play from here. Okay. So what is site reliability engineering? If you ever met somebody who says, go away or I'll replace you with a very small shell script, that's an SRE. They want to get rid of things that bother them and prevent them from getting things done. And when we compare it to DevOps, DevOps is just this broad concept of all the things we do to get functional code into production and run it there, right? Um, but it's a very loose term because then you hear of like Amazon called like a whole competency DevOps. And, and I think it becomes difficult to know exactly what the term means, right? I saw somebody joke once, it was very funny, that uh, DevOps is any person who can install Linux on their laptop. And I mean, it's pithy, but it's 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 got a, an element of truth to it and that these are people who understand a little bit more about the platforms we run on, right? So SREs are this rare combination of sysadmin and programming skills. Um, they don't run stuff in prod for you. You don't throw things over the wall to SREs. But what they do have is the ability to figure out when things are going wrong, what is happening, and dig in to figure out how they can fix it, right? But they also want to get rid of things that are in their way. The idea of toil. They want to get rid of toil by putting together a backlog of work of things that are just of no redeeming value whatsoever to the organization. It's just the way things are because nobody has time to fix it, right? So you create this backlog of things that you want to get rid of if you just had the time. What are examples of toils? Um, if you have a CLI that you have to use for a service, a, a you know, command line interface, and you have to type in the command every time for every host you're going to do something with, that's cumbersome. Wouldn't it be great if it was a CLI that, you know, did things in the aggregate? If you gave it a list of IP addresses, it could do it to all the hosts or something like that. Or maybe it's a CLI that doesn't follow, you know, the conventions of, uh, you know, typical CLIs that we tend to use when, when running with like a, you know, a Unix system or Linux. Um, maybe it's something that'd be changing to, to meet that, that expectation of usage and, and follow conventions we know. Um, provisioning instances with manual strap, uh, steps, any kind of thing you have in your CI CD pipeline that forces you to do manual testing or something like that, that's toil, right? Except when you get to continuous, um, not continuous deployment, but continuous delivery, when you're purposely choosing which release candidates go out into production. Alert fatigue is a form of toil when you're getting constantly, you know, receiving pager duty alerts because of something not working well. And run books. I did a blog post about this, about why run books are toil. Please read it if you want more information. What is not toil? Things that have value inside of an organization. Having to do your security training and learning your OWASP top 10 is not toil, right? Administrative busy work is overhead, not toil. When you have to push a button to release something to production because you're being intentional about that, that is not toil. We care about the four golden signals when we're talking about any kind of website. Um, and for much of the event-driven hosts that are, you know, maybe consuming something from Kafka, we care about the latency of the work we're doing. We care about the amount of traffic we can pump through. We care about the error rate, the non-200 response codes, but also things like sending the wrong data back to a customer, right? Sending somebody else's bank account information. That would be, that would be an error as well. Uh, and a little more insidious because it's harder to detect. And then saturation rates. At what point are my hosts needing to be scaled up or down? right, based upon how busy they are. And saturation can be, you know, a lot of people tend to think of RAM or they think of, you know, the, the amount of CPU that's being used, but 
I tend to run out of other things first, things like concurrent connections, right? Those are the things that I may have to scale up for because I can't handle more connections on this host. Availability is not about you, it's about your users. Your users have to be able to leverage your system. So even though you are up and running, that means nothing if your users are unable to access your host. So never think in terms of your nines, think in terms of your request success rate. What percentage of your requests are successfully handled and sent back to your users and how many are they consuming, right? Care about your SLIs, your SLOs, your SLAs, your service lifecycle indicators, service lifecycle objectives, service lifecycle agreements. Your indicators are the what. Your objectives are what is your goal as a team. Your agreements are the agreements you make with your users. And this is your commitment to the level of service you will provide. You see SLAs all the time in managed services or with you know any kind of software being provided as a service. Um, SLOs are not the SLA values, they're higher. They're the objective of the team while still being reasonable. And SLOs cannot be something you know, that, that is unattainable. They have to be something that you can reasonably achieve as a group. And then the SLIs, I mean, this is just merely the definition of the things you care about, like the four golden signals. SLAs should be tiered. Uh, I have a blog post about that. Feel free to read it if you want. Um, they can be upstream or, and downstream. By upstream, um, when Mike and I were at Facebook, Zookeeper was an upstream dependency of my system. And if Zookeeper went down, I went down. If Zookeeper offered a level of service, I couldn't offer a level of service better than that. And if Zookeeper told me to do something and I had to get back to Zookeeper in order for it to do something, then I had to give them a, a guarantee of how long it would take for me to do that. Right. So that's only fair. SLAs can go in both ways. Error budgets. This is the inverse of your SLO, your service lifecycle objective, the goal of your system for you know availability or for latency or what have you. When you break it, this is the point in time. Say you made your SLO, 99% of all requests will be handled in 100 milliseconds or less for P95. That's my SLO, right? At a latency. And if I break it, then I have to switch what I'm doing and start focus on reliability work in order to get my you know my service lifecycle objective measurement back within range right um, but that has to be a conscious choice you can't just say that as a rule that's the way google says they operate but in a lot of organizations they're going to say well i really want to make sure that i make a choice about that because some features you know we got this big marketing push and it's gonna it's got to be released on this date and if we don't focus on delivering features then we're hosed so Maybe we don't do the reliability work right now, but we, we do that cleanup as soon as we can, right? These, these are just conscious decisions on the part of an organization based on priority. And don't be afraid to, to have those conversations. It should be a productive discussion with your product owners. Change management is where a lot of the errors will occur. Google says 70% occur whenever you update maybe configuration or something like that. Capacity planning and provisioning, you have to think in terms of organic growth as your system is being used over time. How much, how many more users are you expecting over time? Inorganic. At Starbucks, we are releasing pumpkin spice latte on this day. We are going to get slammed, right? You have to be prepared for it and you have to have done your provisioning in advance of that so that you're ready to go whenever the inorganic growth event hits. Observability, it's not just monitoring, it's all the things such as being able to trace requests from service to service and be able to make sense of what happened within your system from the moment that request entered it all the way through all its interactions to when it returns something and collecting and providing all that context so that whenever an incident occurs, you can look at the observability output and know by what information is there, where it died. Just because you say, oh, I don't have all the information, it must have died in there gives you some information about what might have been, gone wrong right off the bat. And those are the things that help decrease your mean time to detection, right? Your ability to figure out what's going on. Um, and then uh, black box versus white box, um, not gonna go into that right now, but capacity planning and provisioning, uh, observable, am I going backwards? Alerts, there we go. Um, <laughs> mean time to failure and mean time to repair. This is gonna be a big part of what I talk about today, but these are your important things for understanding the value proposition of SRE. You have to be able to have a historical view of how often you're failing and how quickly you're able to get back up and running. And this is how you're going to know whether or not your SRE efforts are making a dent in your organization. Is your mean time to failure getting longer? Is your mean time to repair getting shorter? 
If you can track that and show that, then you are showing value for your SRE efforts. Incident management, making sure that you're doing them as well as possible so you can turn through you know, your incidents as quickly as possible, get your systems up and running, but also get learnings from them in the best way possible. And then game your systems. Make sure that you do any kind of drills you can so your team is able to respond to incidents because they've practiced. Just like any sport or any kind of uh, uh, talent that you see somebody like who's a great piano player or something like that, uh, it's because they practice. Same thing goes for when incidents occur. Your team will operate better if they know what to do just because they've been doing it for a while. Uh, and there is a Cards Against Reliability. Um, uh, it's, it's really a GitHub repo that you can clone and, and you have cards made. I did this at Facebook for my team. Uh, it made it a lot of fun for everybody to sit around and play games. So um, that is a real quick introduction to SRE. I uh, just wanted to make sure everybody understood, but these slides will all be available and I have other longer uh, presentations where I talk about what SRE is so that people, um, if you want, you can just watch that video and it's on my um, site reliability leadership uh, blog. So question real quickly, how, hi, how much percentage of coding practice SRE should learn and adopt in comparisons with system design? Um, I would focus on system design if I'm junior, because I want to make sure that I understand the systems so that I can make intelligent decisions about SRE, right? The systems design is, is going to be how things fit together. And if you do that, then you can figure out how to observe it. And if you can observe it, then you can measure it. And those are what you really want to be doing for SRE, not to mention making it fit together better reducing the toil of the pain points between those, those architectural components. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I would focus on system design so I have that, that underpinning of how things should work together, the protocols, the, the stacks, the components, the way they interweave, right? So that you're then able to make sense of them in production. Having that at the basis of your understanding will always serve you well. Okay, so let's go back to the talk as it was regularly scheduled. I hope that was useful. Um, common SRE, miss star. And by this I meant mistakes, misconceptions, misperceptions, misuses, all with good intent, right? Um, but occasionally, you know, we, we see people talking about SRE without knowledge of what site reliability engineering is. I've even had people who I've interviewed who said they've been doing SRE for about 15 to 20 years. And um, they, they uh, have it layered all over their resume. And then whenever I ask them, oh, do you do error budgets? They have no idea what I'm talking about. And this is a fear of mine, actually. The SRE is going to become just another buzzword. I don't want that to happen, right? But let's talk about some of the things that, we, that I see organizations who are trying to start building out their own SRE capabilities. And I've worked with cable companies, banks, um, you know, the large financial institutions beyond banks. Um, a, there's a lot of different kinds of organizations, you know, um, who, especially ones who want to put something out as a service themselves, it, where they're creating out their own managed offering or their own software as a service that they're providing. They want to make sure that they're doing things in the best possible way. But you can't just say we're doing SRE as a top down, you know, um, rule. You have to get buy into people of how they're going to make sense in your teams, right? Are they going to be people who work alongside the software engineers in your organization? Or are they just going to be um, like a team member in a scrum, uh, if you will? If you have a scrum team of seven people and it's got a tester, and it's got maybe a product owner, and it's got some engineers, um, maybe there's also an SRE in there. But you have to figure out how that's gonna work inside your organization and how they're gonna share knowledge among the SREs as well, because one of the things that I think Facebook tried really hard to do and succeeded to a certain degree at was make sure that there was a production engineering culture, right? That we as a group felt like a unique and distinct set of people inside of that organization with our own culture, but while still having a strong relationship with the software engineering teams that we were working with, right? We would be bound to them. We would have our our deep relationship in how we built the software and go to you know building out our backlogs together because it was meant to be 
a, a, a collaborative experience at Facebook, right? Um, but other people may choose a different method. It may be the case where you've got a lot of fires that need to be put out in a specific area and you hire SREs and say, we're going to do this as almost like a consulting group. They're going to go over and work with that team for, you know, five months or something like that and fix this problem following this plan. And then they're going to go the next biggest fire fight to go put that out as well. Um, and that can be tricky because you're not getting the domain experience. You might like they have really strong database skills. Maybe they can't go help that other team because database is what they know best, right? So be planful in the way that you try to adopt SRE. Don't just say we're gonna do it and we're just gonna throw people at it, right? Because that's sort of how you get in the wrong place. Um, some people feel like you have to hire the SREs. Just hire SREs. If you hire any of them, you're gonna have a good, good situation. And I don't think that's necessarily true. You wanna be intentional about the kinds of SREs you wanna have around. What kinds of problems are you trying to fix within your organization that will allow you to get the most value from SREs and hire them first and then worry about how you're going to expand that group to get other archetypes inside your group? Um, and you can, before you even hire SREs, set up processes like a toil backlog and setting up your production readiness review. And I'll explain a little more about that later. Uh, you can you can have teams identify their SLIs and set their SLOs without SREs being on those teams. That can be a software engineering activity for those teams owning their stuff in production. It's not that you have to have these magical people around in order to get it done. So not hiring the right engineers. This is an example I typically give um, at Facebook, and this is a public example. You can you can blog you can you can Google. Facebook and ButterFS, B-T-R-F-S, and, and see this exact example. Um, at Facebook, you know, we're, we're pushing all these images down to all these hosts. And we need to make sure that they're going to run on those hosts. And we have updates coming all the time because, you know, this is an example of places where people can push new features all the time, like, uh, you know, Messenger or Instagram or something like that. Uh, and we need to be able to push those out as quickly as possible, which results in a lot of network traffic. Because we're going to go with image-based deployments. I mean, think about what an image means on a host. It's everything it needs in order to run from, from, from boot up, right? So images can be big. And that means that if you're passing those over the network for every single release out to all of these hosts, it's incredible network traffic, which isn't great for any organization, especially at that scale. So what some of the engineers who were working the SRE team in the group that cared about this did um, they were visionaries and they thought about how they could address this such that they could only download the diffs between an image and the next version, right? And thereby reduce the amount of time it took to get stuff down, but also reduce the amount of network traffic. And part of that solution is ButterFS. Uh, that's having a visionary around. If you have that kind of problem, you have to figure out this network problem. It doesn't really help to have a fixer around. They're great people, super useful, but they're not going to help you solve that how can I dream up the perfect solution to this specific kind of problem? And that's what visionaries do, right? Fixers are the people you desperately want around when everything is breaking around you. They're the ones who can put their finger in you know, the dike. They can put their finger in the wall to keep the water from spraying on everybody, right? Um, they, are, they are just absolute magicians. And sometimes they're not recognized as such when people are measuring the impact of a, an engineer inside of an organization, fixers have a tougher time because their impact is almost implicit. If things don't break, then did they really do their job or were they just sitting around? Sometimes that's how some people feel about it. And it's almost like, um, you know, people who do that unsung hero kind of role anywhere, right? Fixers are those unsung heroes, but they're wonderful. You must have one on your team because when things go wrong, they, they're the ones who are going to help you figure out what it is and just help you get it fixed as quickly as possible. And the facilitators, these are people who are going to be the ones who um, can help uh, a software engineering team understand the concerns of a site reliability engineering team, right? They're the ones who can communicate that well, both with their software engineering partners and with the users of the system, right? When something's going wrong or when a new feature is, needs to be built or something needs to be done, facilitators are the ones who are really great communicators of that. Um, 
Another thing I see where people are struggling is they're not very thoughtful about how to layer in the, the uh, SREs. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Does it make sense to have a group of SREs who are just like, a, you know, a, a SWAT team or something like that, who go in and fix all the problems for one group and then go fix the next group and then go fix the next group? Or does it make sense to do what Mike and I did at Facebook, where we were embedded with our project teams and we worked alongside our software engineering partners, right? And then if you do do embedded, how do you do your um, your, your on-call rotation? Um, and, and this really, it, what, what my team did was uh, this, the software engineers and the site reliability engineers made one rotation. And whoever was on, it could be a SWE one week, it could be an SRE the next week, it didn't matter, right? Uh, but if there was an outage or something like that, SREs were expected to to jump in because this is where our superpowers are supposed to be, right? So if there's an outage and it's middle of the night and the team's really struggling, if there aren't SREs around, people are going to raise an eyebrow. And I think that's fair because, I mean, that's 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 the expectation. So long as you're not burning your SREs out, right? This is constant beating down of is P1 after P1 after P1. Uh, it's not fair to anybody to have that expectation, right? Um, so who owns the roadmap? Is there one roadmap for a team of the backlog of featured work and toil? Or do they each have their own backlogs? And do they each develop their own backlogs? And how do they work together? You know, if the software engineering team says, you know what, we're going to take on a completely new technology, a whole new database, a whole new language. And the SRE say, well, we don't have the tools to support that. That's a problem. Can you really put something up in production when you don't have the tools in place or the support for it with your existing tool chain? These are the conversations that the teams have to be able to have in a productive way. So the embedded relationship can be really powerful. The consultative can lead to very strong results in short periods of time. Um, maybe there is something to do with both. Maybe some teams get embedded engineers and others get a consultant who comes in, just kind of helps them for a little bit and then jumps over to the next team and helps them as well, right? Maybe there's value in doing both, but be intentional about it and have a plan. And I think that not everybody is wary enough of the what would Google do syndrome, right? Um, they, and they, we always hear the jokes of somebody who hires somebody from Google, they come in and say, you know what? Uh, we don't have the things that I had at Google, so we're gonna build them here, right? Um, and that can be good, but if you're not Google, maybe it also isn't such a good thing, right? Same thing goes for site reliability engineering. You have to be thoughtful about what Google does and whether it applies to your organization. So, you know, if I look back on my time at Starbucks, and this is not meant in any way, shape or form to, to make Starbucks sound bad, it's not. If I said to Starbucks, hey, uh, we are going to do error budgets, right? And if we don't use enough of our error budget in a month, then we are going to take ourselves out in production so that we can, um, you know, see what dependencies break around us. This is very much a Google thing to do, according to the Site Reliability Engineering book. But not every organization has an appetite for that. Google has a respect for the fact that, hey, this will help uncover things. But if I'm Starbucks and their thing in terms of revenue and thing in terms of potential lost revenue because we took things down and then we couldn't get them back up in time and we missed a whole morning's worth of redemptions on the rewards program or something like that. That would be very unhappy situation for a lot of people inside the building. And I get it, that's perfectly fine. So when you're making decisions about the site reliability engineering approaches you take, just be intentional about, here's what Google does, here's what we're going to do, and here's why, right? Instead of uh, automatically switching at the error budget, um, We've broken our SLO for latency. So now we're going to automatically switch to doing reliability work. Um, you have that conversation and say to your product owners, okay, what is it you need right now? Do you need more reliability or do you need these features delivered? And the product owner can help you make a decision about the right approach for your organization at that moment. While also saying we will revisit this next week or in three days or something like that. So you have the ability to say, okay, is now the time to focus on reliability? Right. Uh, so just just build in the awareness of how you can adopt the site reliability engineering model to your organization the right way.
Um, real quickly, let's just check and see if there's any questions from anybody. Uh, I see chats. Um, embedded SRE versus centralized is one of the hardest questions. Yeah, I agree, Mike. Um, I think that you know having that centralized org and having that culture like we build at Facebook um, can be a positive, but the culture also has to be a net positive itself as well. Like I've seen some places where um, – you know, the culture could be very much around, hey, let's go to a bar, right? And that's not inclusive either, right? So it has to be a culture that gets SREs working together but at the, and, and, and talking to each other about the problems that they're solving in their groups. So other people could say, hey, we have that same problem. How did you fix that? Um, while at the same time, making sure that it's one that everybody feels like they can participate in, right? And, and that's always the trickiest thing about building culture anywhere. Um, how do you design events? How do you design, acti design activities for people in a community that will be inclusive to everyone, right? Um, I haven't come up with an answer for that. I, I tend to stick to multiple different kinds of events that will attract different kinds of people, hoping to get everybody pulled in in one or two of them, right? Um, but building that culture is certainly important so that the SREs are communicating with each other and learning from each other. Okay, so... Back to the deck. Who decides what to do? I only have this perspective, believe it or not, because of working at Facebook because it was a bottoms up culture, which is something I'd never done before. If you're in a top down organization, that means that some vice president somewhere has made a decision that you're gonna do SRE and you're gonna do it this way and you're gonna have it done by this month. And okay, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because it's all with good intent. That's somebody trying to help the organization do better. Uh, and, and trying to adopt what's being considered a best practice in order to get there. Um, but then, you know, they've got to do all those things about to find the right way to work, the right way for working within our organization, and then building out a plan to get you there. Not just saying we're going to do SRE, but Q1, everybody build a toil backlog while you're doing all your other work. Just think of all the things that are preventing you from getting that done. Put in a list. Just keep track of it, right? Maybe even prioritize it. That'd be great. Uh, and then in Q2, everybody's going to um, work on the maturity model for their service and all the things that they must have in place that they expect from their engineers as part of their definition of done for service to be deployed, you know, an update to be deployed, a new version to be deployed, anything like that. Um, and then in Q3, everybody's going to do SLIs. Define what the SLIs are for your team. And Q4, everybody define SLOs. And by the end of a year, you will have everybody in your teams with an underpinning of SRE such that you can start leveraging the value from it, right? If your organization is bottom up, this is actually pretty difficult because this is where the engineers decide what they think is the most important thing to do, right? And there can be an aversion to people saying, all right, you're making this commitment because when you make a commitment as an engineer, you're going to be held accountable for it, right? So a lot of people don't want to have that toil backlog that is prioritized, saying this is what we're going to do this half, this is what we're going to do in the next half. Um, some organizations are very intentional about that and saying, you are making this commitment. It's okay not to hit it, but you have to explain why, right? Um, I highly recommend that if you're going to track activities, here are the things that we did, here's the reasons we did it, here's the value it, it resulted in, right? Do so only for good and not to you know, use it as a blameful mechanism whenever things don't go the way you want, right? So that blameless culture, it is a, it is something I aspire to in every organization I, I approach. Um, it is difficult just because we're emo emotional human beings. We get into situations where, you know, just the slightest slip of a word can be inferred in a way that makes it sound like you were saying something that wasn't that, 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 that was not blameless. And that's unfortunate because sometimes it's not what anybody meant. They're just in a pressure cooker and they said one word the wrong way. And now all of a sudden there's people really upset at each other. Um, if we all try to assume good intent and if we all try to work together with the intent of making our systems better and trying to have as data driven a, a discussion as possible, we will do better as a group. So this is what I was saying about earlier, not having a plan. Create a plan for how you're going to, first of all, derive 
the measurement of success. That always has to be the first thing you do. Make sure that you as an organization for every service can track the mean time to failure, how often things go wrong, and the mean time to repair, how quickly you're able to get things back up and running. And then create your toil backlog. And then define your SLIs, define your SLOs. With, like I said, within a year, you're going to have a really clear SRE-based approach to the reliability of your system, regardless of whether you have SREs around. And really, do you need to have an SRE around to get some of the value out of this? Why can't SWEs do work like this? SWEs, I mean software engineers. Um, there's no reason a software engineer can't work on something that's considered toil. If it's, con if it's keeping the team from being productive and preventing you from pushing more and more features out and, and, and building more business value, why can't a software engineer do that work? Um, I like to think that if it matters, prioritize for it. And we can't get too hung up in, hey, I'm, I'm an SRE, I don't do that kind of thing, or I'm, I'm a software engineer, I don't do that. We should all want to do the best things for our system such that we get more done. And you know we're able to do more exciting things with the things that we build. That's, that's my view anyway. And then you have to have that understanding of the operational pain that you have been enduring. Um, a lot of organizations are trying to measure mean time to failure and mean time to repair. They may not be doing it at a granular enough level. They may know organizationally, rolled up to an org, how often they have a P1. What they can't always identify is how often an individual service has a P1. And I would recommend that you do that at a service level and then roll things upward. If you start at the bottom and you give yourselves a clear understanding of where the operational pain is, then you can start building it outward from there based upon the dependencies that exist. If somebody identifies that there's a very clear dependency on something that has a very um, low um, a very low mean time to failure, it happens pretty often, um, well, you're going to suffer as well, right? So you can get more ROI from your SRE efforts if you are trying to focus on the mean time to failure of the systems that are causing the most pain. But there are other organizational metrics you should think about. Uh, there's the mean time to detection, which is the, this is the delta between the failure occurred at midnight. We didn't notice it until 1215. Or worse yet, we found out from a user. That is always the worst case scenario. It's hard going into any, any I mean, even in blameless reviews, when you do an incident review and you, you have to admit that somebody told you that you were down, that's not fun. That's just, that's just the reality you face. Um, but you can prevent it from happening again. The worst thing that happens is this is the third time in a row your user has told you that the exact same problem has happened. You know, that's when you're really, really struggling to make a case for how you're improving things. Um, but then detecting and diagnosing is the next big window you need to think about. Okay, we, we knew something happened. We understood what happened at 1225. Right. So 10 minutes later, we had an understanding of what happened. Oh, by the way, when did we tell our users that we were down and we're working on it? Meantime, the communication from the time the outage occurred until the time that you sent something to your users and alerted them that there's a problem. Right. Measure that. Is it getting smaller? Because you want your your users. You want transparency for your users. You want them to understand, hey, we have an issue. We're working on it. Team's on it. We're doing our best, all that kind of stuff, right? Regular updates. Are you are you staying in communication with them while the outage is or the incident is continuing? Um, so measure them in the aggregate as a timeline of the entire event. We communicated here, 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 and here. And it took us this long to detect. It took us this long to diagnose. It took us this long to repair. And by the way, at what point did you fix at what point did you implement the, 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 um, the backlog items that represent the results of your review? Whenever you said, oh, you know what? We need to do X, Y, and Z to make sure that doesn't happen again. How long did it take until that happened? Track that. There's value in understanding that for your organization. Are you not doing enough? Are you not putting enough value on the tasks that need to get done as a result of an incident? Right? Are they not being prioritized well enough? 
because that's there's value in that as well. And what percentage of these incidents are reoccurring? How often is a P1 reoccurring? Um, you want to know that. You want to have an understanding of that if you want visibility into how reliable your systems are. And then as part of this, you have to have governance about the way your services are deployed. I mentioned earlier a production readiness review. Think of this as the maturity model, the checklist of things that your team must be doing in order to deploy a service into production. And some of these can be top down from the organization. I've worked in places where they said, hey, you know what? Even though we run in all our own data centers and all our, all our own networks, we're never in the cloud. Every service must be communicating with every other service via uh, you know, encrypted data. You can't be passing data between services that isn't encrypted. Um, everything has to be HTTPS, right? Maybe they weren't uh, making all calls TLS. And that's not OK in, in a secure environment. So especially if you're cloud-based, right? If you're going to be in a public cloud, you definitely want to make sure everything is TLS-based. Um, so define all these things that must exist, right? And put them into your production readiness review. And then remember that your production readiness review is also evolving over time. As we learn more about systems in production, as we learn more about um, you know, zero days that occur or any kind of security breaches, we can add to our production readiness, hey, check this thing. And then we want to do a regular review of our services, not all the time, but a regular review of them just to make sure, hey, you know, have you incorporated the changes that are in the PRR now? Just to make sure they're doing it as well. Just remember, security always should be the first thing in mind uh, whenever it comes to production for any readiness review. And this will help you eliminate the need for constant pen testing and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, think about what the priorities for are for production deployments for your group and make sure that you have that in your process. All right, real quick question check here. I have a question. With regards to go live operational and production documentation, how far do you go? Do you take into require security, system diagrams, deployment scripts that can be plugged into Jenkins, observability, alerts, performance tests? There is... I, I'm going to be honest. There is, you know, perfect is the um, is the enemy of good enough, right? If, if if this was a perfect world, we'd have everything documented. We'd have all the observability set up, and we would have it all ready to go. So the moment we went in production, we were ready, right? And and everything was was good to go. And I have only once worked in a situation where I felt even close to that. Um, and that's only because we had a fixed date and we weren't under the gun to hit it. So we had to release something, you know, we had nine months to work on it. Uh, we had a plan for how we were going to get there for our development with, you know, our sprint plans. We knew exactly what work, which epics were going to be delivered in which sprints. And we had revised that as we went. And yeah, it pushed out a little bit, but we had enough cushion and enough testing that we did as we went that going into production, we felt comfortable that we had met a relatively strong definition of done around security, around the system and architectural diagrams, the deployment scripting and automation that we had in place for our CI CD pipeline, and the observability of our system such that when we were going live, I allowed the CTO of a multinational organization to watch our, our graphs with me. The very first time we flipped the switch in a country for the very first time, like ever. And it was probably the greatest uh, um, professional achievement of my life. <laughs> because nothing went wrong. And it, it just, it was amazing. It could have, don't get me wrong. Um, but we can't focus on perfection up front. We have to prioritize these items. What are the must haves? What are the super important fast follows, right? Uh, and then what are the uh, things that we want to get done, but maybe they're not going to be done because we just don't have time. And automation tends to fall in that category, right? We want to have a fully automated CI CD pipeline. We want to have full automation of everything from the moment somebody says commit, right? Um, from the moment somebody says I, I'm, I'm now ex uh, accepting a new pull request. Uh, as it goes through that pipeline, it should just all be seamless all the way down the line. And realistically, that's not going to be the case up front because you're, you're focused on other things. 
and you're just making the, the decision that I want to focus instead on this next feature, and then we'll do the automation. But have the automation in your backlog. It's toil. You want it there, right? Performance tests, I mean, I think the, the perfect example of this is actually like chaos testing. I would love to run chaos testing on every system I've ever run in production. And realistically, I have only worked in one place in my life where there was any chaos testing at all, right? Not, not even just in a test environment, but, you know, in, in, in prod. Um, it's hard to convince people that this, there's value in this, especially when it might hurt, right? So uh, I see it as a really high value um, activity but not everybody agrees with me. And I have to compromise on that in order to, you know, make decisions that benefit the overall organization. Um, and that's fine, right? That's, that's, that's doing business, it's being a professional. Uh, does that answer your question? I hope it does. Um, and Captain could be a choice. Uh, I can't remember what that was specifically for, but uh, Bala, if you can give me some context, I'm not sure I even know Captain. Uh, anyway. Let me go back and we can look at Captain in a second. So, uh, you know, providing service government, making sure governance, making sure that your teams have have uh, an understanding of what is required process wise in order to put things in production. But then organizationally, make sure that you're setting up the right organizational governance so that you are able to validate that you are doing the right activities. And some of them I've identified is that, um, and this is common, the, the production readiness review for a service should happen every two years, I think is what we did at Facebook. And I think that's fair. You don't wanna overwhelm your team spending all the time preparing for a PRR, especially one that's mature and has been in production for some time. And everybody kind of understands the production profile, you know, it's, it's reliability profile. Um, it doesn't need to be reviewed constantly. It does need to be re-reviewed to make sure it's still consistent with the latest version of the PRR. So every two years or so, just make sure that you check. It's, it's, a, it's a healthy exercise for everybody. And it's also a really great way for your teams to understand tribal knowledge. Because what you'll find is, especially for larger teams, that um, not everybody understands why something was done X way, X way before, right? And if you go into the PRR and somebody says, oh, I see you're not doing this thing. And there's a good reason for it, right? Maybe somebody says, we can't do HTTPS because of the, the latency of certificate validation and decryption. And you say, that's ridiculous. And they say, it's high frequency trading, man. We can't do it. Okay, maybe that's organization, a data-driven decision that somebody made, and that's fine, right? But now everybody in the room understands why that decision was made way back when, when they weren't around. Maybe they just joined the team. Have that blameless mean time to failure and mean time to review discussion where you're saying, okay, for this service, everybody, let's, let's get in a room, all the leaders of all the services here in my group. Um, you know, Hey Mike, can you tell me, um, you know, in the zookeeper group, how is the MTTF and MTTR trending? Can you show me a graph of how the last three months and year have been for you? And everybody looks at it and says, Oh yeah, look at that. Wow. Okay. Um, first of all, for a lot of groups, you're going to be dependent on each other. This will help everybody see how everybody else in the room that they depend on is, is doing. It will help the organization make decisions about who needs help, right? And is there value in the activities that they've been investing in? And then also an understanding of where your system critical dependencies are. And having a group that knows upstream the dependency chain, it's one thing to say, I know I depend on Zookeeper. But you know what else I, I kind of depend on implicitly as a result of that? The JVM, right? What JVM are they using? And, you know, or is, is that the right one for what we need, right? Can it support the kind of heap sizes that we need for that Zookeeper uh, implementation? Um, these upstream dependencies are super critical for people to understand as a spider web. And just having that review of, hey, for this service, its critical dependencies are X, Y, and Z. Okay, great. And what does their profile of, you know, uh, of, of reliability look like? Um, are there SLAs that they're offering downstream of them? Um, are they higher or lower than that of the service that depends on them? Because how can I possibly offer an SLA higher than something I depend on? That doesn't make sense, right? So having that kind of critical dependency review every six months as new dependencies are added, 
uh, is super important. And then toy overview, where teams say, all right, in our backlog, these are our priorities. And this way, organizationally, other people in the room could say, hey, you know, we have that same problem. Um, and or we're already working on something or we already just fixed that. Do you want to see how we did it? Right. Or maybe create a library or a service that solves that problem organizationally. So toil review is something I think you have to do pretty often. And if you do all of these activities, if you if you go through and, 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 and think about each of the things I've said some people aren't doing, right, or you have to make sure you're doing, um, you can create an SRE strategy that allows you as an organization to describe the way you are implementing SRE. And this is no different than a cloud strategy, a data strategy. If people understand the way you are adopting SRE, they don't have to sit around asking leaders what they should be doing here because they know based upon a strategy that is clear and well described. So as an example, if I, I, I just wrote a blog post about this and if you want, you can go to the blog. I just, you know, it's site reliability leadership um, at Medium. Um, if I'm an airline, and I want to create a rewards program. Uh, I have a rewards program and people can, can earn miles and they can redeem them for seats on flights, but they can't do so for my partners. And a lot of people are saying, you know what, I'm going to start flying a different airline. If you don't allow me to uh, get you know points, it'll allow me to fly somewhere you don't. I want to go to the Maldives. I want to, I want to visit Saudi Arabia, um, but I can't do that with your airline. And um, what's the point of having these miles if I can't do stuff like that? So there's business value to this organization. We all know that loyalty programs result in customer experiences that, you know, um, that generate revenue for any organization that has one. That's why they're such a big deal. So, you know, understanding that and creating a business strategy that will allow you to allow for redemptions with partner airlines, thus giving people the ability to exploit their miles in the ways they want. You know, this is a business strategy a, a company can implement and say in three to five years, we are going to do this by, by year three, we're going to have this capability with that airline and this capability with that airline by year five, we're going to have all the airlines, right? That's fantastic. Um, but now you need a digital strategy to approach it. Somebody has to be sitting down and saying, okay, as a result of the business setting up this business strategy, somebody has got to come up with, Here's how we're going to do that. We are going to take the existing rewards program, which is built with some sort of COTS software, or not built, but you know, a package that they bought somewhere, and doesn't allow them the extensibility in order to implement you know, partner redemption. Well, we're going to build a custom system that's going to allow us to expand our business in a meaningful way. We're going to invest this much money to build a custom software system that allows for the redemption of partner um, seats with our miles. And that's now a digital strategy saying you're, you're going to do it in the cloud um, and you're going to do it with microservices and stuff like that as a deeper strategy. That's the technical strategy to the digital strategy. But you're going to have a cloud strategy around that. Okay, you're going to do this in the cloud so that you can get to market as quickly as possible, leveraging managed services rather than standing up your own. Okay, which cloud provider are you going to go with? Are you going to do a hybrid solution? Are you going to strangle off your existing services using the strangler pattern where you slowly, you know, carve out pieces of functionality and move it to the cloud, or are you just going to do a complete and total cutover all at once, right? This is all part of your cloud strategy and your data strategy is going to be what databases and what, what storage mechanisms are we going to leverage from, from caching all the way through to cold storage, right? So you have these various kinds of strategies you define. The SRE strategy is one as well. This is, how we implement our, our, our SRE approach within our organization. And you know what? As we bring in new technologies and we need new skills and new, new uh, capabilities in order, and new tools to support them, that's how we're going to do it as well. So create that SRE strategy so that you enable everybody in your organization to understand how they should be going about their work. It should be the defining guiding principles of SRE for your group. And then revisit. As the strategy evolves, the businesses 
organizational strategy, the digital strategy, the cloud strategy, the data strategy evolved, your SRE strategy should as well. Um, that's really my talk. I have a couple resources to point to. There's always a site reliability engineering book. There's the Building Secure and Reliable Systems book that came out in April. Uh, they're all free um, electronic books on the Google website. You can Google them and find them. Um, there is a new book coming out soon. This is 97 Things Every SRE Should Know. I'm super excited about this because it's got people like Katie McCaffrey and Charity Majors, uh, just amazing engineers. Liz Fong Jones is another one. Incredible engineers who I want to learn from, you know, like Liz Fong Jones, if you don't know, they're doing this incredible work around um, moving all of Honeycomb systems. Honeycomb.io is an observ observability platform. Um, doing all this incredible work about migrating to Graviton ARM processors in AWS. And this is fascinating to me, right? Because everybody's talking about how, you know, it can be up to 40% cheaper and you can get up to 30% greater performance. And Liz is posting graphs and talking about what they're seeing as they're, as they're running through this process. It's just incredible transparency on their part to share that kind of information. And I, I appreciate it greatly. And I wanna learn from people like this, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I can't wait to see this book. This is coming out sometime soon. The Art of SLOs, if your team is trying to figure out how to define your site, uh, your, your service lifecycle objectives, it's tricky. Google has a whole course for your team to work through. It's 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 got some holes in it, like some of the slides aren't always completed, but maybe that's fixed by now. Um, but it's still a great resource to start with. You know, look at what Google has done. They publish a tremendous amount of information to help you. And then there's a weekly blog that I follow. It's an aggregator. It just posts interesting stuff every now and again about, um, you know, SRE articles that have been um, that have been published in the last week or that they found in the last week. SREweekly.com. I'm old enough that I still use an RSS, RSS feed, so uh, I get it every Sunday night. And it's it's just a useful way to keep up with what's happening and, and find stories about interesting outages that have happened in the community. And then there's my blog. Uh, it's there. If it's a resource and it's useful, great. If it's not, that's fine too. I don't uh, I don't have it set up as like one of those money making medium sites or anything like that. I was just too lazy to set up my own WordPress. So anyway, um, so now I am open for questions. Um, let me see what's been posted here. So, uh, okay, Mike Jones says, a big part of any org's SRE strategy should be how to build more SREs. SREs come from dev, ops, QA, whatever backgrounds. Yeah, you know, and, and this is a great case. I think a lot of people expect that SREs are gonna come pre-baked, right? That you're just gonna be able to hire SREs that, are fully formed into this magical creature. And that's not necessarily true. Um, what you really wanna be doing is identifying people who have interests in lower level parts of the system. There are people who do really amazing things, writing you know, um, high, higher level programming languages that exploit you know, uh, the capabilities of a system, but maybe they don't understand how to hack the kernel. You know? um, and that's okay, right? There's value in people who can do that. And there's also value in having people around who do deeply understand the network stack inside of your Linux boxes, right? Um, so identify people who have an interest in those kind of things and have, have demonstrated skill even. Like maybe in a previous job, they were a system, admin. maybe they were a system admin in college. In, in my day, because I'm really old, uh, these are people who would who would run the computer labs at the school I, I, I would attend. And and at night, they'd be running things called MUDs. And this is sort of like an online text-based Dungeons and Dragons game. The, the, the lab would become their personal, like, hive of activity. Because, um, I mean, you'd still have students in there writing papers in the middle of the night because that's how students are. But, you know, I don't think this is relevant anymore because nobody goes to a computer lab anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's how old I am. But back then, uh, you know, anybody who, who was that kind of person could have been an interesting SRE candidate. But also, somebody, you, you have to be looking for those archetypes, right? Who's a fixer? Who's the kind of person who likes to dig in and try and figure out how to, who's the person who always has the answer? 
when an incident is occurring and you're trying to figure out what's wrong, who's the person who always seems to dig in and say, I found it, right? Maybe that's your fixer um, or the visionary, right? But if you start people down the path of building out SRE uh, capabilities within your teams, such as, you know, the mean time to fail, your mean time to repair, the toil backlog, the SLIs, the SLOs, you may find that people over time start doing some of these activities themselves, saying, I want to fix that toil thing because it's holding us up. It's driving me crazy. I got to do something about this. So Mike, great point. Identify people that you can help be, you know, become SREs. Okay. Oh, goodness. Can you share some of your favorite tools you use to visualize and monitor mean time to failure and mean time to repair and error budget consumption? So for mean time to failure and mean time to repair, a lot of that has to do with sort of pager duty type um, views. If you're using a tool that allows you to see how often incidents are occurring on a service basis, you can do that. You can do mean time to failure to graph that and, and through it, right? Uh, the error budget is a tricky, trickier one. You have to have an observational system or set up something through Splunk, right? That allows you to measure when you're breaking your SLO. And it's going to do that by, you know, doing um, sampling of, you know, latencies. It's seeing from logs that are being reported from various components of the system. Uh, let's let's use latency as an example because it's really concrete. If I set up Google Analytics on my front end, you know, it's a web page or something like that, uh, I can capture the information about the latency there that I then send back as a package for my logs, right, to be part of my aggregated log through tracing of a request from end to end. Uh, I can see, okay, this is when it got back to the client. And I can start measuring whether or not I'm breaking my SLO through there by setting up an alert. And I can then say, okay, well, how often are we breaking this? When is our P95 falling for some window, right? And the window shouldn't be too small because if you set your P95 for a day, then, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're like 99.9%, .9%, it has to be within below a hundred milliseconds at P95. Um, then in, in a day's window, you know, you have one event and you've broken that or something like that. And that's just not useful, right? So it has to be a, a big enough window of like 30 days at least, maybe even a quarter. And say that, hey, we're breaking our SLO for this quarter, right? We're in one and a half months into this quarter um, and we are now below our SLO. More than, um, more than, less than like we're at 98.6 percent of our uh requests are being handled successfully um under 100 milliseconds uh for p95 and when we do that we can now say all right it's time to transition because we now have visibility into it so you can set up alerts on that uh, and you can do that through splunk or any other aggregated logging tool new relic is starting to do this now too um and there are tools that are starting to come out. I haven't had the chance to work with them yet, but that are SRE specific. Um, people are starting to adopt these concepts into their tools explicitly. So um, I don't have them off the top of my head. If anybody wants to post them in chat or something like that, things they've worked with, please do. One of the things that is tricky about having worked at Facebook is just about all the tool chain is proprietary, right? It's our own stuff that we've built. And as a result, it's hard for me to say that, hey, this is something that worked really well at Facebook, right? Because we built our own. We had our own like Splunk-like tool called Scuba. So any other questions I can answer? Uh, Jamie, I've actually got one and it's kind of me being a bit nosy. In terms no, of sure. like incidents, obviously you've worked at two fairly very well-known names commercially. What's like the biggest incident you've been part of? Oh boy. Mike, how much trouble can I get in here? <laughs> yeah, like, I can understand Facebook probably has some privacy. I'll tell you what, I, I'm going to tell a fun one and I'm going to anonymize who the company was, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, this, this was a really interesting one because this, this was 
I had joined this one company and it was, it was a super exciting job. And I took over this team that had a dependency on another system, but it was a dependency that a lot of people had inside the company. Right. Um, and what, what is interesting is for some companies, when an outage occurs, you get the strangest interactions on the internet. Like if Twitter goes down or something like that, the whole, or Gmail goes down, the whole world just assumes that Google's under attack from China or something like that. And that isn't necessarily the case, right? It's, it's, it's probably more that there was a configuration screw up that took down a whole bunch of hosts, right? But when you're talking about massive scale, things can cascade ridiculously fast and it can be brutal to live through. So in, in a case like that, where you know th this company had massive infrastructure, uh, somebody made a change that um, you know got pushed to production, that took out core infrastructure for everybody, and it was an intern that did it, and the the you know things started failing all over the place, and you'd think, well, just roll back, right? It wasn't that simple. It was like whack-a-mole for the people living through this as it just propagated and propagated. It was almost as if there was too much automation. If there is such a thing, great automation can also be really painful when you can't stop it. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we had this rampant process of updating with this, with this bug all over the place. It literally took everybody down in the platform group that we were working in. And it was a rough, I don't know, half a day. Uh, and it, it did take a couple of days to restore systems back to nominal run, right? But the questions that are asked in an incident review are very telling. And I remember sitting in an incident review for this one and somebody said, oh, well, yeah, it was an incident, it was an intern that did it. And I was like, yeah, but the question has to be asked, how is an intern allowed to push something like this to production? What processes do we need to have in place such that that can't happen again, right? Because the intern had all the best intentions when they were trying to do something. It wasn't like they said, ha, ah, watch me take down you know, <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing, right? <laughs> no, that's never the case. Um, but the questions that are being asked in the review, you know, it says a lot about the culture of a company and the willingness of people to say, you know, especially whenever later on, if, if it's, you know, when you're doing annual reviews for a company or something like that, and somebody says, oh, we're going to punish them for that. They had that bad outage. They allowed that thing to happen. And, you know, it's always gratifying whenever you work with executives who say things like, we don't do that here right? That's not how we operate. Um, so when you have a blameless culture, look for when people are trying to say it was an intern. You know, they may not be pointing to a name, but imagine being in the intern pool when word gets out, because when you're all trying to get hired by that company later in the year, and somebody knows that an intern took something out that caused a problem, well, that's that can be enough for people to say, I don't know if I want that person around. It may not be right. That's why we want blameless, right? Um, so good times there. Uh, other examples of really nasty outages. Um, it's, it's never the big ones that are really painful. Yeah, they suck. They're no, they, but when you're down, you're down, right? And there's a finality to it that I can appreciate. It's the partial failures that will drive me bonkers. It's the little things that are kind of happening, but not really happening. And they're not happening in a deterministic way. So therefore, it's really hard to reproduce. Those are the things that drive you to distraction. And the crazy thing about it is this is also where I think that any kind of property-based testing or chaos testing where you are injecting randomness into your system will help you uncover things that maybe you couldn't just test for. Not everybody can think of every possible scenario of things that will go wrong. And it, it's funny, I, I know Colton Andrews, who's the CEO of Gremlin, um, he helped devise uh, the, the Chaos Monkey system at Netflix. And prior to that, he was at Amazon where he did something similar. Um, he, uh, 
he he very fam famously says that within 20 minutes we will teach you more about your system than you ever wanted to know <laughs> you know and that's it's it's such a great way of expressing the fact that there's no way for me to build every test that will express every kind of production outage that I may encounter, right? And there's also no way you're going to stand up a system that is like production, right? There's just nothing that can be exactly like production in, in, in the real, in a testing platform. It's just highly unlikely you can do that. So having that willingness to expose yourself through chaos testing Maybe even set it during a maintenance window. Say to your customers, we're going to be unavailable for these six hours, you know, in the middle of the night for whatever time and run chaos tests, right? And be prepared to completely wipe everything and, and, and be able to restart, you know, before going live at the end of the maintenance window, right? But get value from that, right? There's, there's, there's something useful to it.